Hello and welcome to another episode of Startup Hustle Middle East. Today we have Paris over here. Now Paris is the creative director of GID, which stands for Guy in Dubai. He's got his own TV show on OSN. Very soon it's going to be coming on Everett's, I heard as well. Yep, and yeah, we've also uh, just signed a contract internationally with a, a broadcaster called ORF, which is... Um, uh, the national broadcaster of Austria and Germany. Brilliant. Oh, very cool. Yeah. So, um, so today we're going to find out a little bit about Paris's entrepreneurial journey. So before doing TV, he uh, he was uh, the CEO and founder of a couple of businesses, right? And uh, also we're going to learn about how to make a TV show and how to how that uh, works out and how how that happens. Yeah. So, um, so Paris, can you tell us a little bit about your background? Uh, when did you come to the Middle East? Uh, how did that happen? Yeah, okay. So I came to the Middle East two hours after my last exam at university. So I... Um, <laughs> Which was where? Edinburgh University. Okay. So I had um, come to the conclusion um, in the last final couple of months of university when everybody is just trying to figure out what they're going to do after their exams. Um, even though I was studying finance and I did my master's and my CFA, um, the finance world was crumbling in mm -hmm. London. You know, mm -hmm. like I went to one interview and the guy seemed really happy. I said, by the way, how did I do? And he said, uh, yeah, great, Paris. And I said, so, you know, do I have a good chance? He said, well, let me just be straight with you, Paris. We fired 8,000 people today. Oh, and, my God. And I realized that um, it was a world that was just uh, not very welcoming of mm -hmm. uh, people coming out of university. So I had made the decision that I wanted to set up a business. Um, I had already established an entrepreneurial flair before university. Um, but um, I also felt that I needed, if I'm going to get international experience, I should do it early. And I needed to be in a faster growing place than the UK was at that time. Mm -hmm. And the fastest growing place in the world was Dubai at the time. Okay. And even though I had never been, I'd seen a lot of things about it. And I had started to put together the pieces of a business where I thought I had some funding uh, from somewhere and we were going to set this up in Dubai. So we went on a recce. Mm -hmm. um, so two hours after my last exam, my mate Pete, who was my business partner, was was like, Paris, come on, the plane's about to leave. And I got on the plane, we came out here and we spent uh, a week and a half here, mm -hmm. did a recce, decided that this is where we wanted to do business. Um, and then it took me about a year to get my affairs in order in terms of actually getting the investment secured and, and everything. And in the end, I took investment from um, an Omani businessman who was a very uh, successful businessman in Oman. Um, and the plan was to utilize his office for the first six months mm -hmm. and then to move to Dubai because okay. we were setting up a price comparison site for insurance. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so I had come to see that in the UK at the time, these aggregation sites, as they were called, which was essentially comparing, you could do it in any industry, but you mm. can compare different providers in one website mm -hmm. that right. that was useful to people online and people can then purchase and there was a whole business model for it. So, Which year is this? Uh, so we started this in 2009. Okay. Yeah. Oh, that so, was uh, quite ahead of its time then. Yeah. It in, was at for least this for the region. Middle East, yeah. yeah. Yeah, well, it was interesting because I had gone to some com uh, a conference when I was at uni and it was basically the, these aggregators had just shaken up the whole in insurance industry. And so I was like, mm -hmm. I need to do this. And <laughs> yeah. so, so all I was doing was copy paste. And actually yeah. our whole business was copy paste. We were looking at different portals saying, hey, I like what they've done there. Right, that's what we're going to do. Oh, I like their model for this. Oh, they make money that way. You know, and we just basically took the best bit of everything, put it into a, a model. Uh, we launched it in Oman um, and we never got around to launching it in the UAE. Okay. okay. Um, in the end, I decided to uh, step back from it. We'd been we'd taken three years to mm. do this business. We developed the technology ourselves. We had mm. uh, sixty developers working in house for us. Wow, uh, sixty developers. Yeah, mm. it was a big operation. Okay. Wow. Okay. okay. Yeah, no, and this I, is very anti startup. Uh, well, we st well we st started humbly. I okay. Mean, first of all, started lean. Okay. Well, it, first of all, before I got the investment on, I was a chef, and I would <laughs> I, at the end of. Uh, my shift I'd go to the McDonald's where we had free internet and I'd be writing up my business plan and sending it to Mohammed <laughs> okay. in Oman That's awesome. okay. and we were, we, were, we were grinding like that then when I when I finally to be honest I'd been telling everybody at home I'm going to move to the Middle East I'm setting up this business so the the the, 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 the idea the, of failing was not not there exactly but yeah. it was also the, the, the 
first level of success was when I was actually sat there in this office in Oman and I yeah. didn't even right. know where Oman was. Right. <laughs> and now, and I'm here and I'm like, you know what? I did what I said I was going to do, even yeah. though we haven't made a drop of money just yet. Yeah. I, I've, everyone's now like wow he actually did that you know yeah but it's so, a bold move though moving to the middle east uh yeah. starting a business right off the bat I mean, yeah it's right a, out of uni that's yeah. pretty good yeah. yeah well looking back i realized actually how um how bold it was and i, I look back and quite impressed at how i did things back mm -hmm. then you know yeah. um so i moved into his office and he already had a team of about seven okay and then we started hiring um and um he, he was a good guy to learn from. He was cutthroat. He was mm. he was he was a hardcore businessman. He mm -hmm. um he did things the, uh, the you know he, he pulled up his sleeves and got got down with it. Um and you know I used to see him push around CEOs of massive businesses because at times he had been CEOs of massive businesses, but he'd right. now come back to work on. He's always want he always liked being an entrepreneur. Okay, so even though he. You know, a lot of entrepreneurs, when they grow, mm -hmm. they then, you know, do investments and they work in large companies mm -hmm. um, and they, they like that safety. He mm -hmm. he liked to sell it and then go back to starting again. Okay. Right. So I, I did like that about him. So, um, so all this was muscompare.com, right? Yeah. So actually we had a group of companies. We had muscompare group. We had, mm -hmm. Musk, um, we had a whole load of different portals um, mm -hmm. and we had a technology company called Fastlane Technology, which okay. was, again, it was all in the same group. We all, okay. We, we were all the same office. Okay. But we uh, had different websites for India, for Oman, okay. uh, for UAE. And uh, then we had uh, something that we did specifically to, to license our technology to insurance and bank and banks for them to sell their own okay. products. Okay. Oh, so, we, so that was what Fastlane Technology was. So this was, um, you know, I learned a lot from Mohammed. Um, mm. uh, that was, that was, uh, it was good. But I mean, looking back, I, I, you know, I, I felt like I kind of outgrew it in a little bit. Okay. He was somebody who didn't strategize mm -hmm. and that was driving me crazy because mm -hmm. he, he would be like, Oh, this is what we're doing. And then we invest all our resources into that. And then, Oh, this is the next. And so like impulsive, he was very impulsive. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So it was hard to actually have a sort of, you know, have Direction. a plan, mm -hmm. work towards that plan mm -hmm. and then achieve it and then move on. Um, and for that reason, we spent a lot longer mm -hmm. um, getting to the finish line. And and that's part of the issue. And I think a lot of entrepreneurs do this mm -hmm. yeah. is they set the finish line and then they keep moving the finish line as they get closer. Mm -hmm. And that's a really dangerous thing, especially yeah. in technology, because yeah. you can run up massive costs in terms of development. For yeah. sure. You have yeah. to say, OK, this is where we are going to be happy enough to launch it for us to then start earning money mm -hmm. and then to start developing further. But we just kept developing and developing and developing. Yeah. Yeah. That's but an agile methodology, right? Like yeah. you basically, you ship as soon as possible with as less features as possible, lean, and then you build on it. So yes. you Yeah, but I think also that uh, entrepreneurs need to have a happy balance of uh, being agile and being very strategic mm. because you keep hearing about how like if the market is telling you things, you need to pivot or you need to relook at your revenue model or relook at your business model. So I think it needs to be this happy balance of not doing it impulsively, but yes. if there are factors that are telling you that the finish line that you planned is not really there and yeah. you need to move. The, I think it needs to be that happy balance. Well, absolutely. I mean, you, you'd be foolish to set out with a hard-nosed strategy about something, uncover an amazing opportunity and not mm. take it on. Yeah. So yeah. You, you need to do that. But at the same time with technology, you need a plan. Right? Yeah. So, so um, you know, from what we were doing, we we just needed a bit of a strategy. We were uncovering opportunities and taking them on, and that was yeah. fine. Mm -hmm. So um, so then I moved to Dubai full time because mm -hmm. for those three years that I was in Oman, I was back and forth. Mm -hmm. um, so I was I was very familiar with Dubai, and I'd been doing business here. But so it's been seven years full time here. Um, okay. Uh, I produced a few other businesses. One was a leadership development business. So that was Rise? That was Rise UAE, where okay. we had a mainly focused on uh, a mentor program. Mm -hmm. And the mentor program was like a matchmaking service, service where we matched, whether it was an aspiring entrepreneur, even a student, mm -hmm. or it could have been the head of a major organization. And we matched them with somebody who had already walked that path. Okay. And, and who could talk from experience about 
um, you know, to guide them in terms of what they need to do. So it Does was different this? to coaching. Okay. Yeah. Does I, something I, like this exist right now? I don't know, actually. Um, yeah, I because, think it's still a good business model. Well, it you, you know what? It exists in some way or form, but our ambition for it was very high. Okay. So we wanted to be able to take the heads of massive organizations, and we did, and put them with people who had already succeeded in massive organizations of that okay. level. Right. Um, so the target audience was C-suite. Uh, well, that mostly. was one side of it, but it, it was just more, more the... the the, the quality and the level of the mentors that we were having. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so, for example, we had some people who were sports stars. We had one lady who was the first Arab lady to climb Mount Everest and climb okay. the seven peaks of, of, the, of the world. Completely different set of experiences. Yeah. yeah. Um, we had one guy, a very interesting guy called uh, Major Chris Keeble, who was the head of the British Special Forces in the Falklands War. Okay. And I did a lot of work with him, and wow. I really enjoyed working with him. He's an older chap. He must be about 76 or something now. Okay. Um, and but fit as a fiddle, okay. right? Every day does 2,000 meters on the rowing machine. And he had created a whole um, framework mm. for ethical leadership. Okay. okay. Which I, I could sit there and listen to him for, for hours. But his, his stories of how he mixed leadership from a war zone, mm -hmm. which was um, generally a bad place, mm -hmm. but he needed to make ethical decisions mm -hmm. um, and how he how he handled those uh, d uh, those decisions and then how you apply that, that in business. To business. That's very cool. Yeah, it yeah. was very yeah. interesting. So, yeah, he was he a great He could write guy. a book, I think. I think he has, yeah. Oh, okay. And, uh, yes. So what is the monetization strategy? You charge the mentees? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. It was a paid service. So okay. that, And we took a cut, like a middleman. Okay. okay. Um, so, yeah, it was... Uh, we, it and was it one-on-one -on -one mentorship or did they come and speak and inspire so several... So, mentorship was one-on-one, -on -one, but we did also do workshops okay. and training programs where we would often combine workshops that were specifically tailored to what an organization is trying to do. Okay. And that could be for, you know, their sales staff or um, we used to have an Emirati development program, which was for the young Emiratis that were coming on board. Mm. Um, we, uh, you know, so basically it would be tailored to whatever it is they need. Okay. And then we would then have a mentor that would work with them with their personal development program mm. going forward. Because okay. the thing is, is you can't, solve a problem or develop somebody with a booster shot yeah it's an ongoing thing so yeah. you would you would do a large proportion of it within a workshop mm. but then continue it going forward for the next year or even two years okay yeah. i think this kind of happens right now mostly with uh, aggregators we see that uh, wamda launched wamda x as well and yeah. they have mentors uh, from different startups from namshi yeah but they're they're a different kind of thing they're grooming you to be a mentor so that they can, so you can uh, be no. a founder of one of their funded companies. No, they're not grooming you to be a mentor. They're, uh, they're, they're grooming mentors. you to be an entrepreneur. entrepreneur. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So now the mentorship aspect happens mostly through aggregators, I would say, and, and incubators. But it's still a, yeah. a, a really mm. good model. Yeah. Yeah. So what happened with Rise? Well, I it mean, it did not rise. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> it was too easy. We picked up a lot of. Um, uh, we we did well in the period that we were operating. Okay. The, the problem um, actually ended up being a partnership problem. Me, okay. me and my partner didn't decide, didn't agree on one thing one day, and uh, that was we had a few businesses together actually. Mm -hmm. um, things that I don't always publicize because they never really took off. Mm -hmm. right. um, there there were things that uh, we were working on but didn't come to fruition mainly because we we clashed horns essentially and. Mm -hmm. uh, for a couple of months, it was very ugly, and then we kind of shook hands and went different ways. And uh, um, unfortunately, that happens. Yeah, yeah, no. yeah. It does happen sometimes. Um, yeah. But it was a shame because we had a good couple of years of almost a perfect business relationship. Mm -hmm. yeah. He was my mentor. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay. And, and so it was. A, I think it was a, a. Maybe that was half the problem. Um, at some point in a mentor relationship, the mentee starts to outgrow the the mentor. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or it maybe starts getting a little bit. Um, too cocky <laughs> um and um and there starts to be a little bit of a, a rivalry there yeah. Um, yeah and um it is quite hurtful actually when you fall out because you yeah. look up to that person and now you're not getting on with that person and that person feels they've done a lot for you and that you're not appreciating it yeah so it 
it was unfortunately a bit of an ugly uh, uh, breakup for a couple of months, and then okay. and then we kind of said, "What the heck?" Yeah, <laughs> yeah. There's, there's no point. Yeah. All right. So no, I, just... I think a very important startup lesson over there uh, when it comes to founders working together. I think it's it's true that if you are in a relationship where one person is aspiring to be like the other and then eventually wants to be an equal in business decisions, it can get a little bit. Well, that was part of the issue is, you see, when you are a chairman and a CEO, mm -hmm. there's a seniority mm -hmm. difference. Mm -hmm. When somebody is a, um, a director or an employee, mm -hmm. there's a there's a hierarchy. Yeah. Yeah. But when you're partners in a business, yeah. you're both shareholders, you, you can't let somebody feel that they have a senior yeah you can't be a pushover this is yeah. your this yeah. is your money this is your uh your, your shares this is your business yeah. therefore nobody can make those decisions for you so mm -hmm. in the end um i didn't on partnership issues mm -hmm. i only wanted to agree on what i wanted to agree on and yeah. uh, in the end you see if we hadn't fallen out at that time we would have fallen out unfortunately yeah. because it was the, the dynamic of things wasn't wasn't so good because okay. Because we had that uh, hierarchy mm -hmm. already set, yeah. becoming partners was um, uh, it, not, it didn't not a great decision. Complicated. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So I just wanted to check one thing. So you went from um, technology-based, um, highly scalable kind of business, uh, which was your uh, comparison website, to being a very hyper-personal. Uh, you know, mentorship led a business. So what, why did you decide to switch so drastically between like business models? Well, I've always considered myself an entrepreneur mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. terms of what is my role on this planet. Mm -hmm. And each business is a new project. And whether that is a aluminium plant in Ghana or mm -hmm. a um, leadership development business in the UAE or any other business, it's a project. Okay. And setting it up is almost the same process. You have because the thing is, is no matter what your expertise in, is in something, when you're setting up a business in it, you have to learn it from scratch. True. You have to figure yeah. it out. Yeah. So now there are the industry specific elements to something, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but in all honesty, you don't need to be a doctor in those things in order to be able to set something up. You will need somebody who's an absolute expert. Yeah. But you can hire those people. Right. Um, and those people are probably so smart at what they do, they don't think they could ever do it. So they never mm. go and set things up. <laughs> mm. So um, they need somebody who is kind of doesn't care about the risk and willing to give it a go, mm. like yeah. me, to, to go see the opportunity. So I've always been very good at understanding where the supply and demand is and yeah. where the opportunity is. And then learning what you need to learn. Usually I find within six months of being in a business – I'm good enough to be able to be a somewhat of an expert. Somewhat of an expert. So you at least look like one. Yeah. yeah. You know, maybe I'm yeah. not one, but you know, I, I certainly learn enough that I'm able to you understand the industry. Yeah. Because with anything, it's so much better that you really, really, really understand the core fundamental uh, fundamental basics of something mm. than it is to understand all the tiny details. Yeah. yeah. And if you can really, un and what you find sometimes is some of the smartest people can't narrow it down to the what's important yeah. yeah and that's what i've always understood in um in business and entrepreneurship is understanding like just the very basic um problem uh, that you're solving yeah, exactly the basic mechanics of the business yeah. that's the most important or everything your else is key performance indicators yeah. 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 yeah 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 that's interesting like uh Usually we've had uh, entrepreneurs that are subject matter experts and on that particular area of the business or like crazy passionate about it. But for you, that's almost secondary. It's like, this well, is yeah. the gap and I'm going to go after it, you know? Yeah. I mean, I hate to sound like a snob, um, but, you know, when I see people who have spent 20 years as an accountant and then they go set up an accounting company, I don't consider those people entrepreneurs. Mm. You see, an entrepreneur, somebody who goes and sets up, is, is a business setter upper. Yeah. You know? yeah. Uh, so, um, although those people have gone through an entrepreneurial experience that they're going to learn from. So, I mean, like I said, it's snobby for me to say that, but I consider entrepreneurs to be those people that ba basically go around looking for opportunities, setting things up. Sure. And uh, they, and I pretty much feel that you can apply that in 
almost anything. Mm. Almost I agree. Anything. Mm. Yeah. yeah. So your next project was Koba Education. So yeah. can you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah. So before we get into the interesting TV stuff. Yes. <laughs> okay. Well, actually, I'm going to tell you something a little interim part. Um, which is about the TV stuff. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because it was just before I set up Cobra Education that I had an epiphany. Mm -hmm. Now, I mentioned that Rise UAE went down the pan because of a partnership issue. It got ugly. Mm -hmm. And at that time, I was thinking, you know, I'm not where I should be. Mm -hmm. I was meant to be a billionaire by now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and two of my businesses have now failed. Mm -hmm. um, and they actually got quite ugly. And I've invested a lot of time. Mm -hmm. Because when you set up businesses, you're not doing nine to five. Yeah. You're doing wake up till sleep and your weekends. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I had a girlfriend at the time who never got any time. And she was mm -hmm. always complaining that I never spent time with her. And, you know, I was sacrificed. I remember sacrificing my Christmas day when she went down to her home where mm -hmm. her mother had a terminal illness mm -hmm. and she wanted me to come because she thought it might have been her mother's last uh, Christmas and my mother went to help look after her and I said no I've got to st stick with the plan I you know wow. I'm setting wow. up a new business I can't let my partners down mm -hmm. three months later my partners are trying to sue me you know and uh, oh. uh, I realized that these kind of sacrifices are not worth it um, and I thought to myself that I can't keep going on sacrificing the only thing I have which is my life and my time on the planet mm -hmm. yeah. for some pot of gold mm. at the end of it and this pot of gold is really when you think about money and things like this it's really just uh, freedom tokens mm. yes the freedom to do what you want yes and so I thought about it I thought well what's the point of sacrificing your freedom mm -hmm. you know you know, eventually you get, something. get the freedom yeah, yeah. at a time when you probably won't be able to use it exactly yeah. so yeah. it's like saving sex to your old age it doesn't yeah. make sense right yeah. so like and also um, it's a zero sum game Mm. Yeah. So I thought to myself, I have to find a way to make a living or make a business out of the things that I love. And I thought, well, what do I love? Mm -hmm. And actually, that's a really tough question to answer mm -hmm. because we're conditioned. And certainly at university, we're conditioned to think, oh, I, I love doing this and I want to be a philanthropist and I want to, mm -hmm. you know, whatever it is that... Mm -hmm. We, we start to get conditioned by society and the successful people that we that we start to idolize. And then we forget what what we really wanted when we were kids, mm -hmm. you know, what yeah. was it that, you know, I wanted to be an astronaut or I wanted to be, you know, whatever it is, you know, sports mm -hmm. star, mm -hmm. singer, whatever it is. And so I thought to myself, well, I love travel. I love adventure. I love uh, uh, people. I love partying. You know, I like having fun, basically. Mm -hmm. sure. So I thought, well, how do I make a business out of this? And mm -hmm. Um, I came up with this idea um, mm -hmm. called Guy in Dubai, which was mm -hmm. a show. And I started putting the ideas together. And at that time, because I hadn't, I was kind of lost in terms of what my next business was going to be. Mm -hmm. I was trying to set up a few different things at once. Mm. And this one passion idea, Guy in Dubai, came came out of out of nowhere and i started talking with a friend of mine who was a videographer he loved mm -hmm. it mm -hmm. and we started uh started uh working on the idea mm -hmm. um now it ended up being that one of the other ideas got the money okay okay so when you're faced with someone now ready to invest in one of your business plans mm -hmm. you've got to take it seriously so that was cobra education and mm -hmm. um I partnered with a UK company and basically set up their Middle East office. And mm. we, we were partners here. Um, and it was interesting because now, now I have a coach and a mentor and mm. he okay. managed to explain something to me because essentially what happened with this business was I worked like crazy for seven months. Mm -hmm. uh, like an entrepreneur should do. Uh, mm. Got it on off its feet and, and we started, we made some, good money at that point mm -hmm. i then expanded the business in terms of people and then mm -hmm. i sat sat back and i was hoping that they were going <laughs> to do the business for me okay. okay and now i understand the whole mentality behind this now that a coach has run me through it after my last business had failed it was very important for me to prove to myself and to them and to other people that i was capable i was capable i was the missing link okay. it wasn't the money mm -hmm. it wasn't um the help i had from other people it was my entrepreneurial ability that made it was a success so i was determined to do that and mm -hmm. i did that and i made the money and i in, in, increased my staff and and so forth mm -hmm. but my passion 
was somewhere else. Yeah. Sure. And I had already figured out what my passion is. Mm. Um, and I think the nuts and bolts of recruiting teachers, which is what this business was, wasn't my passion. Mm -hmm. um, now, I enjoyed the business side of it. Mm -hmm. um, I've always enjoyed the business side of it, you know, promoting the business, you know, we were getting it in magazines, we would, you know, we would, I was having fun with all that, managing the stuff. The media part of it. Yeah, I did the like PR. the media part of it. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah and it I makes like, sense now. And yeah. I like managing the staff. I liked all that side of things. Because um, that's the same in all businesses. Yeah. But the actual act of recruiting a teacher and placing it in a position. Did that not satisfy you. That wasn't it, did, it didn't satisfy <laughs> me, but I also had no skill in it. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, it wasn't where I came from. It wasn't mm -hmm. my personality type either. Yeah. So at one point, we actually had to downsize, which was you know you know i had to eat humble pie and then i had to really start pulling up my sleeves and and doing the nuts and bolts of the business mm -hmm. now i remember a quote by steve jobs which was passion is the most important thing in entrepreneurship mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. any rational person would give up yeah, yeah. because it's really hard <laughs> yeah yes. yeah it's a grind for now, sure yeah. now i and, and at the time i I didn't think that he was right, but then I started to realize he was because I could pull my sleeves up and grip my teeth and do the do the 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 gritty work for only so long yeah. in a business that you're not really passionate about the nuts and bolts of the business. Yeah. yeah. In a business that you're passionate about, you can do it as long as you want. Yeah. Yeah. You love it. Yeah. And it doesn't matter if it doesn't pay you that well. Yeah. So you're going to wake up at six in the morning to go to Aquafun for Guy in Dubai. There we go. <laughs> yeah. I love it. Yeah. yeah. I love it. Yep. I don't, nowadays, I don't feel like I work. Honestly. Yeah. So, yeah. so basically, that, that business started to, to dwindle and it dwindled and it was a really, again, a valuable lesson for me. Mm. That I, it, it was most important that um, I work on my passion. Mm -hmm. okay. And so, uh, in the end, we, we cut our losses with that business. Mm -hmm. um, and I decided that I have to uh, only do my passion. And okay. as an entrepreneur, you always have a lot of people who are, who are like, hey, you're a guy who can do stuff. Help me with this business. And mm -hmm. oh, I need a director for this business. And you're always getting pulled left, right, and center. And, mm -hmm. and naturally, uh, you want to help people. Mm -hmm. and you want to be involved in things. Mm -hmm. I've realized that if you want to be successful, once you found your passion, that's the only thing you should do. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, there's no point in having a side business and my mum used to call me up and try and convince me that I need to have a plan B and I'd, mm -hmm. I'd shout at her and say mum there's no plan B's mm -hmm. right? <laughs> there's plan A but, or die but right? die in Dubai was your plan B which became your plan A well, correct? well I guess it was it was the it, it was, was a side hustle well, it was, to be honest until the point where the other business had we, we, we cut our losses with it it wasn't it was just a an idea. Thing. Okay. Mm. Okay. I had started cr to create things on social media. Mm -hmm. Started changing my my name to Guy in Dubai, and everyone's like, "Oh, what's he doing? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Trying to brand himself?" They didn't mm -hmm. realize I had a whole idea for a show. Like they didn't. Nobody knew okay. what my plans were with it. Okay. Um, and then when I created the show, they're like, "Oh, it's crazy that you've kind of turned your social media into a show." I was like, "No, it was always all a show. Along. Always that, that that was the idea." And only when I. Um, created that void by getting rid of the other business and putting that aside mm -hmm. then i had all my time for one thing mm -hmm. now it wasn't making any money and i didn't know how to make any money from it to begin with mm -hmm. so um it it was scary and i didn't have any money either mm -hmm. because i'd lost money in the last business mm -hmm. i was nickel and diming um and it's you know so what? you had no safety net it had to work yeah, yeah, oh, absolutely. I mean, <laughs> I've been nickel and diming many times in my life, but it was okay when I was 24. Mm -hmm. It was okay when, you know, at certain times. But then I'm, what, 32 mm -hmm. or 31, something like this. Um, and it was uncomfortable nickel and diming mm -hmm. when your friends have now just bought a house with a nice mortgage and they're getting mm -hmm. the cars and you know there i am you know dating girls and they're kind of like mm, you know like <laughs> so what exactly do you do yeah. and i'm trying to explain to them all the successful things i've done but they're looking at me now and they're like i'm not seeing it yeah. um and so you know you have to just realize that you know that's you're not going to be very successful with women for a couple of years because you've got to get this thing on the go. Um, so no, I mean that, a lot of that's things. That's a big motivator, I think. Yeah, it, it was a big motivator, and um, you know what I did is I, I managed to barter my office for a month uh, for a year. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and then I bartered the gym next to the office, mm -hmm. and then I would run to the gym 
so that I didn't, because I didn't have a car and I didn't want to pay for taxis. Or I couldn't pay for taxis. Mm -hmm. So I was that broke. Oh so I God. would run to the gym, I'd shower in the gym and then walk across to the office and then I'd work there till nighttime. And then I'd walk back and I'd walk through Satwa mm -hmm. and, uh, and then over to Jumeirah one where I was living. And you know, it was really difficult. What for, do you mean you bartered though? Like you told them you'd do content for them? Yeah, so basically I um, did events there. Okay. Um, I created all their social media. I was also writing for the national newspaper. So we kind of, I put- Plugged little, them. Plugged yeah. them. Yeah. So basically, I, and I've always been very good at um, waggling these sorts of things. So- okay. um, Hustling. But, yeah, hustling. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah. hustling an office for a year was, was definitely one of my better hustles. So, um, <laughs> and it was- really That is great. pretty good. And it was, yeah. uh, it was on Sheikh's Head Road in the Millennium Tower. It was lovely. It's amazing. Okay. Yeah. So, um, and, but for me, it was very important because that was my place to work, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and, and, uh, yeah, I had a really good time doing that. So, um, you want to talk about the TV show now? How I got yeah, it set yeah. up? Yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, so basically in order, one thing I had realized, and I'd realized this through social media, mm -hmm. that if you have an audience mm -hmm. that you can make money because Absolutely. whatever, whatever yep. it is, you know, um, you can sell things, mm -hmm. you can, um, whatever it is, you, you, you can make money. And I you can sell mindshare. Yeah. 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 Whatever it is. And actually I learned this when we were doing Rise UAE, mm -hmm. when we set up a leadership event and I was like, right, I need to get a hundred people mm -hmm. to it. And I sent out like 400 emails thinking a hundred people will come mm -hmm. and then realizing that like only one person had signed up and, <laughs> and then I had to get hold of more databases. And I realized that I need to have an audience mm -hmm. before I do these things. Yeah. yeah. So I developed my LinkedIn and I became a LinkedIn influencer okay. way, way back then. Um, so, you know, I had like 40,000 uh, followers and connections like on LinkedIn. Mm, yeah. Even seven years ago. Damn, man. So I hope you're sharing this episode on LinkedIn. Then. Yeah, I will yeah. do. Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> so, okay. uh, Hi, LinkedIn I, fans. <laughs> it's me again. Um, so, I, I have a question. Who's yeah. managing your Instagram right now? Is it you or your team? So, like responding to comments and things. Oh, that's me. Okay, okay because you're, I mean, taking a, sl a slight detour here, but you're very good at that because, yeah. of course, we stalked you before this episode and stuff. So every sing almost every single person that has commented on your last picture with Burj Khalifa, the, the Eid picture, Every single one, you've been very good at maintaining that relationship where you're like, uh, what are you doing with your acting right now? Or do you have cool stuff coming out as well? Or you have a really good feed? So like, and, and active, it's, active, it's active very much engagement. active engagement, mm. very personalized. And I was like, wow, this is really interesting yeah. because we keep talking about nurturing relationships and how that helps your startup. But this was seeing it in action. Yeah. So. Well, yeah. I mean, listen, you hear a lot of people um, saying, oh, I want, you know, I want more engagement. I want more, um, uh, more followers. But if you don't care about the people who already give Follow. a damn about you, yeah. yeah. Then, you know, like, don't, well, then it's just a number. Yeah. Don't expect other people to. So yeah. I, by the way, I just want to touch on something. Um, yeah. Because and you and said I think that. people don't realize how much time and effort goes into growing an audience. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like, uh, but he's doing a good job of maintaining that audience. True. Is, is yeah. The, is yeah. The now I always do no, that. But that's time, right? Like you need yeah, to spend time. time. Like people sure. think like, oh, I've posted a picture every day and now, uh, like no, my Instagram's not growing. Yeah. But yeah. It's, it's these kind of things that in, yeah. like, you know, going into other people's profiles, talking yeah, so, yeah. I mean, look, I can't remember everybody who, who comments. I've got a few people who I recognize because they comment frequently. frequently yeah. Yeah. And, you know, they feel they know me. Mm -hmm. And um, so I, I need to, like, if, if I don't care for them, mm -hmm. then I don't care for myself, really. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Like, what's the point of me um, doing all this stuff on yeah. social media if I don't care for the people who actually are interested in what I'm doing? Mm -hmm. um, so somebody wrote um, on that one, cool edit, love it. And I, and I had to take a little, I've seen her before, but I can't mm. remember who she was quite so much. So I took a little look at her mm -hmm. uh, page and she says that she's into EDM, which is um, electric dance music, music. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and, uh, and a few things like that. So I said, thanks. Uh, thanks, Lovey. Which festivals are you going to this summer? Mm. Was just, just a guess. I just thought she'd be going to festivals. She's in EDM. <laughs> mm. And she said, um, in an hour, I'm heading to Chicago to Spring Awakening Festival. I'm super excited. Best of best DJ is going to be there. So sweet of you to remember what I love to do. 
if EDM <laughs> festivals happen in Dubai, I'm there and you can teach me your famous dance moves. So <laughs> <That's> a- <laughs> it, it, it makes a difference to people. When, sure. when you, I took a little bit of time and I did that with everybody. Yeah. I take a little look and, you know, whatever it is they're into, I'm trying to create a conversation. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Now, it does two things. It makes them feel like, I'm important, important. Yeah, as well. I'm important. There's an actual conversation going on, but also it creates a conversation that's more mm. engagement going on. So sure. it's good for your post. So, so I do that, and and also now um, I reply to all the almost all the messages that are sent to me. Mm-hmm. So I used to get a whole load of hey, 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 yeah. and and it's a little bit annoying to be honest. Yeah. yeah. Um, and a lot of people that are messaging me, I'm like, I don't need to have a conversation with these people. Mm. Then I thought, well. This is it's similar to a comment. They're mm-hmm. reaching out because they like what I do. Yeah. So I started just, you know, I try and keep it short. I don't mm-hmm. have enough time in the day to be talking with everybody. Uh, but I'll send back like, thanks, mate, or whatever. Mm-hmm. Okay. But it makes a big difference. Yeah, sure, yeah, for sure. And sometimes they have a little short conversation. It's not a big issue. Mm-hmm. Like I, I, it, Sometimes people do then be like, hey, when can we meet? Let's go for coffee. And, you know, then it's yeah, a little that's bit intrusive. Tough. Yeah, <laughs> Sid had that recently. It happens to me a couple of times, actually. And I do meet some people. Yeah. yeah. I do meet some people. Like, yeah. Uh, yeah. like uh, one, one guy reached out to me. He said he's moving to Dubai. And a lot of my content on YouTube is about living yeah, in Dubai. Yeah. So he reached out to me and he sent me a message saying that, you know, I'm moving to university in Dubai and I and I watched all your videos and you're one of the reasons I'm moving to Dubai and can we please meet? And I was like, yeah, I'm busy. I just had a baby, by yeah. the way, in case you guys didn't know. Yeah. So I have a little baby girl and, uh, you know, I didn't want to get away from her. So I told him no, but he kept insisting. So finally I said, okay, I'll meet you for a coffee for like yeah. 10 minutes. So sometimes I do it. But it but, was a good meeting. But it was a good meeting. Yeah, yeah it was yeah, nice well, You know yeah. what? And here's the thing is, is I realized that a lot of these people, they're, they're great people. Mm. Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and, and yeah, you attract your tribe, right? Yeah, so. and 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 I mean, some of them look like great people, mm-hmm. but some of them don't necessarily look like great people on Instagram. But in person, they are they're great, great people. people yeah. Yeah. Um, but one of the things I've realized, uh, so what I've done is I've, I've realized it's a sensitive thing. If somebody asks to meet you, you can't say sorry, but I got no time. Mm. Yeah, they're your fan. Yeah. So you have to be careful about this. So I've put together a little bit of text <laughs> okay okay <laughs> <laughs> your go-to template yeah, yeah for all the people that i because honestly I, I i i just can't meet yeah of course yeah. no um, you your um, your time is your money right so absolutely yeah. so so what i do is i have a little bit of text i say listen i, I i'd really love to meet everybody that um you know is part you of my social out. media but unfortunately i just don't have time mm-hmm. uh however um I, i'm gonna let everybody know my Instagram stories where I'm going next. And if you'd like to come, I'd love to meet you there and mm. we'll have a drink. Yeah, that's yeah. fair. And, and and actually, I like that because sometimes people actually, they come sure. up to me and I'm like, hey, you're the guy in Dubai. And I, I like speaking to them and then and there mm. because I'm out and about. That's, that's great. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. Um, I just... Uh, We're carving out dedicated time. time dedicated to like time is, yeah. is difficult. Yeah, you know? yeah. Um, yeah. So, sure. sorry, we took a little bit of a detour in terms of community management and <laughs> social and audience management. Okay, well, it's, it's about but, an audience. And, yeah. And the yeah. audience is... so. Audience is valuable. Mm-hmm. Eyeballs are valuable. So I had realized through my past businesses that there are certain networks mm-hmm. that already have those eyeballs. Mm-hmm. TV stations, mm-hmm. websites, mm-hmm. news publications, um, other people's social media channels. So all these ways they have eyeballs. Um, so I thought if I can create good quality content, mm-hmm. um, I can utilize their eyeballs. Mm-hmm based on a concept and some kind of pilot that I've done. Um, and with that, I can turn around and get sponsors. Mm-hmm. And yeah. Because I've been in the business world, I knew how to do this. So, mm-hmm. you know, I knew how to pitch things and uh, get product placement on and things like this. Mm-hmm. So what we did to set off is we created four pilot videos, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Um, and that w- was basically for us to be able to tell, show people, this is what we mean when we mm-hmm. say guy in Dubai, this crazy adventurer who goes around doing all these fun things. Mm-hmm. Because if you allow it to their imagination, they want to take it one way or another, or, you know. Yeah. So and I, you still want to have a control of creative output. Exactly. Once yeah. you, once you sort of lay it in the sand, this is what we do. Mm. Then they can see it and understand. And then they're coming on board to that mm-hmm. right. know, rather than them saying, you know what we need? We need a guy who can go to restaurants and do this. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, because then now you are doing what Change they need. You know? yeah. <laughs> so, so 
So we created four videos. Uh, in order to do that, you know, I had to work out an uh, arrangement with a guy who was a friend of mine. We'd worked on some videos in the past. It was That was his forte was um, videos. And I said, you know, look, let's partner on this. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I showed him my plan mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and he, he believed in it. You know, he believed that there was money to be made. Mm -hmm. So we did um, we did four videos. Mm -hmm. uh, after that, we started having conversations pretty quickly with mm -hmm. OSN. Okay. However, the conversation when the, from when the conversation started till when we actually went live with them was maybe seven or eight months. Okay. So it took some time. Um, yeah, but that's how it works. <laughs> I think. Yeah. Yeah, we but know that's that not bad. The lead yeah. time is is yeah. long. Six yeah. seven months is not bad. And yeah. one of the things I realized, you see, with TV, TV company's license content mm -hmm. if it's exclusive content mm -hmm. so the thing is if you are in the social media world and you put your videos out on vlogs you can't then sell that as an exclusive content to anybody mm -hmm. the idea about exclusive content is is if you have something of high value that mm. people will come to watch that people will have to come to subscribe to their channel or watch mm -hmm. their channel in order to view that content yeah hence why things like you know if we take it to an extreme level things like game of thrones mm -hmm. which yeah. have such massive value check <laughs> <laughs> i don't think that the snoring is being picked up uh, is, is the can anyone else hear the dog snoring <laughs> Is it it's being not, picked up? In the slightly. Sound? That last one came out. Exactly yeah. right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, so uh, she's not part of your audience. Yeah. No. <laughs> so essentially, TV channels will pay huge sums of money to Game of Thrones to have it because they know the whole yeah. world almost, except me, because I don't watch it. <gasps> is yeah, I don't watch Game of Thrones. <laughs> We'll, we'll have to switch to that channel. Mm -hmm. So it has pool power in terms of bringing subscribers or viewers, right? Yeah, sure. we now got Wavo because of it. You got Wavo. I mean... Well, there we go, I'm on Wavo. So yeah. I pulled you Wavo, okay. Wavo. Wavo. I call it Wavo, you Wavo. Okay. 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 Um, so yeah, so so that's the idea is... is um, um, they, they all have different models in terms of how they monetize. These mm -hmm. on-demand platforms, or they're called SVODs, subscription mm -hmm. video on-demand platforms, same as, okay. same as Netflix. Okay. They work on subscriptions. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, as many subscribers as possible, the more money they have. Right. They're ad advert-free. Mm -hmm. um, then you've got traditional TV, which is free to watch, but they have adverts. adverts. adverts yeah. So they're more about viewership. Mm -hmm. So in either way, that's how it works. So... Um, so essentially, uh, what I wanted to create was something a level above what vlogging is, because mm -hmm. vlogging is very casual, um, you know, and, and in Not order high to production generally. Yeah. Yeah. It's mid-level production. Mid -level I mean, because production. vlogging is usually a one man or maybe a two man job. Yeah. yeah. So you can't have the level of production quality that like a TV show might have. Yeah. Well, I think the biggest difference is if you want to succeed on YouTube, Mm -hmm. You need to be creating regular content. Yeah. Yeah. On any social media yeah. platform. At least now, once or twice a week. Yeah. yeah. You need to be creating like, because it's about feeding people mm -hmm. like, yeah. uh, and, and, the, and the vloggers who have done the best are the daily vloggers. Yeah. yeah. Right. So the thing is you can't create a video every day and create something epic every day. Yeah. Yeah. You can't Unless create. you're Casey Neistat. Yeah. Unless you're Casey we like Neistat. Casey Neistat. Yeah, no, but I'll, I'll, but, but even that. Casey Neistat, you'll see there's some filler, some filler episodes yeah. in there. Cause like, it's impossible. You can't, you can't be creative and have amazing production quality every, every single, single day. day. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, you know what he's very good at is he's a very good storyteller. Yeah. yeah. And, that, and that means that he can tell a story and essentially he can do that no matter what his day is. Yeah. yeah. But if, what I had in terms of my vision for this character, Guy in Dubai, remember, remember this has come from me figuring out what I want to do with my life and mm. me wanting to do crazy extreme sports and traveling mm. and everything. Mm. So in order for me to do that, and I wanted to take it to a, another level, I had to orchestrate big things. Mm -hmm. So like, for example, so one of the things that I did was I powerboat raced the world's fastest powerboat, the victory team. I saw that one. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. So things like that, I can't just pull that those things off every day. Yeah. Um, and to be honest, if I'm busy every day creating videos, I'm not going to have time to orchestrate those types of things. So, yeah. so I wanted to do something less frequent, but higher quality. And then mm. that allowed me to basically get into the TV world because mm -hmm. they need something of higher production quality. Mm -hmm. They need, um, you know, the sound has to be very good. The, the you know, the video editing, the, mm -hmm. um, 
the the managing of emotions through the video has mm-hmm. to be thought about. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So um so that's where I wanted to play. Mm-hmm. Um and hence I haven't put our full episodes on social media because mm-hmm. if I did Yeah, it loses its value. Then nobody yeah. licenses it. Yeah. Right? yeah. So um there will be a point when I will, but okay. that's when we've created more new content. I'll put the old content up. Okay. Right. So the plan with Guy in Dubai was never to be a social media influencer. It was to be a TV personality. Um, or it was or create a TV show. Or create or create a TV show. Because a lot of people are like are exactly yeah. where you are where you're like I want to do new things and and uh, have access to new experiences and collect all these cool experiences and I want that to be my life but a lot of people go about it in the way of yeah. being a social media influencer so, so I would say it was my strategy rather than my goal it was my strategy to go for <clears throat> TV kind of production whether mm-hmm. that was going to be a web series or a subscription video on demand or TV or mm. things like Uh, so we also uh, as well as Emirates Airlines we also license to hotels directly so oh, okay. they, they play it on their room TVs okay. so these kind of deals I kind of package them all under TV okay. it's not strictly TV okay. but um uh but to use uh, to to basically create things for TV because mm-hmm. that would be the quality content that I could mm-hmm. do mm-hmm. but to use social media to promote that yeah. and to do because you the thing sure. is, is you need to manage the both yeah, yeah. um and that so so now we have two two kind of productions we have our social media vlogging that goes on which is covering everyday stuff mm. yeah and uh something like what we did or is that going to be a tv show that will be a show oh really okay. yeah all right guys so in case you guys don't know um uh, i run my own youtube channel as well and we did a collaboration together kind of thing uh we did uh, aqua fun which is this uh, the world's largest inflatable water park and uh, we played some tag on yeah. that cat and mouse <laughs> it, cat it, and mouse it was a very good video so it was cool i've yeah. seen yours yeah so I'm my my video is already on youtube if you guys want to go check it out um and, and uh, uh, this your is video coming is on going to be on uh, so ours Google? will be uh, most likely on emirates airlines uh, okay. we will do a version for social media okay. okay so so we so this is how we do it we use the tv stuff where we create 10 minute Long videos mm-hmm. and then we'll do like a one or two minute video edit for social mm. okay. which will be done a little like bit like a teaser yeah okay, okay cool. it'll be a little bit quicker there won't necessarily be so much uh uh storyline but we can create something short from it yeah so cool. you're catering content based on attention span of viewers as well yeah. in the channel in the yeah. medium okay yeah. okay great so, so uh so these video on demand platforms mm. do they pay you per view or is it like oh because they have exclusive access to your content it's, uh, it's a fixed like a retainer or something well I think they all worked in a slightly different manner so I can only tell you how mine worked. I basically got paid the model was I would get paid per minute of video that I licensed. Mm-hmm. So it was a flat license fee, well based on how long the video was basically. Mm-hmm. Okay. And uh, my videos are between 8 and 10 minutes. So I we'd get paid that up front. There was no trail commission on terms of viewership or anything like that. Okay. Now, okay. Netflix I believe works a slightly different way where it's a little bit more performance related in terms of how many people are watching it as well. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um so I think they have a kind of uh, a, a measurement of how they apportion some of that too. Yeah. So yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean the way Netflix works, there's a lot of data science behind the way it works with recommendations, yeah. with viewership. So I can imagine that the way that they pay their uh, content creators and when they're producing their own is also related to minutes of watch time how often yeah. Yeah. things like that so yeah. yeah so there is also two different types of models so mm-hmm. you have commissioning and licensing okay mm-hmm. so if you've heard of netflix originals that's commissioning okay. commissioning is where they'll give you the money up front based on your script and your idea okay but they have co-production rights to that so essentially they're going to give you the money to go produce it but they have veto rights yeah well they they, they have control first, the production a little first bit first of all they have licensing rights for their whole platform mm-hmm. no. and then you're not really allowed to license it anywhere else mm-hmm. but they unless it's in agreement with them and they will take a cut of that too. Mm-hmm. So essentially you co-own it because yeah. they've invested in it. Yeah. Yeah. Now if you don't have money that's a great way to do it because they you know you need the money for production. The other way is you take on the cost or you somehow figure out how to do Produce that it, yeah. which is this is the model well, that I you use. use. Okay. Uh 
now I fund it through sponsorship. Okay. So you can get product placement. Yeah. Um, we've got tourism boards who, who help us out and things like this because ours is very much tourist related. But then you own the content mm -hmm. and you can license it wherever you want, mm -hmm. essentially. I mean, you might license it to one company, a uh, TV station who might take exclusivity mm -hmm. for satellite television across the Middle East. Yeah. But you can then, if you go and license it to another category, so another region or another mm -hmm. category of TV, mm -hmm. um, you know, um, that's all your money. You don't okay. have to split that with anybody. Okay. So tomorrow Netflix came and said, we want to pick up your show. You'd be able to do that. Yeah, no issues. because you don't have exclusivity license you have yeah okay. so i had and also exclusivity is also for a period of time yeah right. so, like it's like uh, when you do production and there's usage rights right exactly so yeah. so i have um my deal with osm was an exclusive arrangement okay. for the middle east but it was a for a certain time for a certain time right. yeah. now i managed to negotiate mine down to a very short time which allowed okay. me to then do more yeah mm -hmm. um uh but yes essentially um uh, that then that doesn't stop me from doing anything with airlines or hotels because that's considered okay. a different category. Category, yeah. right? And it makes sense. I mean, uh, your target audience is tourists and people uh, yes. looking to find out what experiences you can have in Dubai. So you're hitting all those. Yeah. You're hitting the areas where that audience is present. Where yeah, that, where and you get those eyeballs. Essentially, if, if you're good at licensing and mm -hmm. you can license to many places, you can actually make a lot of money that way because you can license multiple times you can essentially sure. resell stuff you can so you have one content produced once and you make money off it multiple ways multiple times yeah exactly yeah. Yeah. and that's where the word video asset mm -hmm. which is what they started calling it to me in tv mm -hmm. um started to make sense mm -hmm. you've created a video it's an asset because now you can juice that asset mm -hmm. by licensing it to many places where on social media it's a video and it's gone yeah, yeah. And it's not really an asset anymore. I mean, maybe on YouTube you consider it slightly an asset because sometimes they pick it's up over time. It's lifetime value. Yeah. Yeah. If you look at things like Instagram, you create a content and within, you know, 10 days it's kind of depleted. Yeah. yeah. You know what I mean? Or a story. That, and that's why I prefer YouTube to Instagram because it's got longer, uh, got a longer lifespan. Yeah. And that's why we started the podcast as well, because we see some of our older episodes getting traction over time. Yeah. So I, I like uh, platforms where uh, the content keeps getting eyeballs over time. So whether that's a blog, whether that's, uh, you know, YouTube, whether that's a podcast, it's great when the content organically performs well yeah. and, and yeah. you create evergreen content. So not super topical. Mm. Um, so then you know, this, this conversation is just as relevant a year from now, Five right? Years from now, yeah. Five yeah. years from now. Exactly. exactly. If the topic or the person or the discussion, uh, is, is, is adding is value yeah, and it picks up over time. Yeah. 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 So that's our whole content marketing, uh, strategy and, uh, for essentially this for this show. <laughs> yeah. Um, but essentially it was started to uh, promote his business, which is, uh, his startup, which is a jar car. So, so tell it's, me. it's got multi, multi, uh, multiple reasons. Yeah. So and we get to have conversations with interesting people like yourself. So, yeah. Yeah. So, so tell that. me something then, because mm -hmm. I'm a video guy and, I, you know, obviously I know about podcasts and I decided, you know what, I feel rightly or wrongly that video is the most powerful media yeah. of all medias. Now I know there's a, uh, a gap in the market for, um, podcasts, lots of people listening, mm -hmm. not so many people creating. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I can understand that, but what would be your advice to somebody like me or what would be your thoughts behind podcasting as as a useful tool to market yourself <laughs> so uh, the advantage of podcasts is um, a couple of things uh, first of all it's a replacement for radio right so you got to think of it in that way so it's uh, usually somebody who's driving to work who's going to be listening to it it's a little bit more long format so you can get deep into conversation like this episode it's, is probably going to be about 40 minutes long right yeah. 30 to 40 minutes long and we've seen our statistics people actually listen for more than 50 to 60 percent on average wow. so so there's a long time that they're spending with you yeah right. so they're listening to you for 10 to 15 minutes 20 minutes so in that way it, it helps you establish that connection a bit more 
it's a bit more real. And I think uh, as people are moving more and more towards streaming platforms, you choose what you want to listen to, right? Yes. Rather than being on the radio where you're just consuming whatever's on. Like it could be music, it could be a talk show. Here. Yeah. So, uh, so it's kind of moving towards like how YouTube did for video like podcasting has become the audio version of that right and uh, people listening to music on apps like spotify and angami which also promote podcasts yeah it's, it's it's a great thing the thing is that i think podcasting is very interesting because it's uh you can listen to a podcast passively. So it could be something that you're doing while you're driving, while you're walking your dog. And it doesn't require you to be looking at your screen. Yeah, so, it's a passive way to yeah, consume I, I do it when I straighten my hair. Like, I mean, it's so it's a really good right, way. Yes, I do this. Well, I, even if it's a YouTube video, but I'm just listening. Yeah. yeah. I will have my AirPods in and I'll be making breakfast or what have yeah, you. So, yeah, so so just as easily, a lot of people shift to podcasts, usually when they have longer commutes. So people that are driving down from Dubai to Abu Dhabi are more likely to listen to podcasts because to cover that drive time to gain some information. So podcasting, a lot of people listen to podcasts for entertainment, but more so for information and education. Yeah. So it depends the, uh, on the edutainment. Ed edutainment is the key. So can you tell us, aside from Guy and Dubai being the TV show, what else does Guy and Dubai media production cover? Yes, well, we do... Everything in video production. Oh, yeah. Everything in video production. So, I mean, and that can be applied in many ways. So we do okay. social media production. So we obviously okay. do our own social media, but we do social media for companies. Okay. Um, we do corporate videos, um, pretty much anything that we can do with, with video cameramen. content. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then um, uh, we, we are also producing a show for someone else. Okay. Uh, where they're the presenter and they're, they're kind of producing it and we just do the, the production. Okay. Um, and That's cool. Uh, yeah, that's that's fun. Um, so yeah, actually, you know, I would like to produce more shows that maybe are not necessarily us. I mean, Guy in Dubai's got. I'm the host of it as well. Yeah. Um, I can't be everywhere, so we, yeah. we can also produce other people's shows. Then, um, you know, because of the um, publicity I got through the show, I mm. often get invited to do live events hosting. Okay. So I hosted the Burj Khalifa fireworks at New Year. So that was a big event, you know. Oh, nice. Oh, wow. Yeah, Very that, cool. that was huge for Ema. So uh, things like that are, are good. You know, I, I used to turn my nose up to that stuff and say, oh, no, I don't do live hosting. But now I've realized my profile fits it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm quite good at it. Mm -hmm. and um you know it's it's it gets a bit of publicity and it's you know so I, and you know what, it pays quite well so okay um, great uh so i do so it closer now. to the pot of gold now yeah okay yeah Ooh. yeah yeah well, but also you know now now that we so in january i took on investment we hired staff mm -hmm. so you know i can't be so picky about what i do mm -hmm. you're but, responsible for all those people oh well, yeah you know they're kind of relying on me to churn over some money uh, mm -hmm. uh you know i'm relying on them but you know i've got a get out there and do it too mm -hmm. so uh, these things are, are good um so i quite like these live hosting things and it's interesting because each event is different mm. True. um you know one time we went to a construction site uh for, for um margin alpha tame for one mm. of the new malls and i was basically hosting everybody taking them around you know with my construction hat on and okay. it was kind of kind of interesting and funny and uh so it's very very different to okay. uh you know hosting new year Okay, great. Um, so uh, I just want to check with you. How was that uh, experience of being on camera? Was it weird to begin with? Uh, like, did you have to build up that... Uh, confidence. That confidence to be on camera? Initially? Yes, absolutely. Um, I've, I think I got a video of me when I first did it and I, I can't even watch it. <laughs> yeah. I was so stiff. Yeah. Uh, but you know, the way you get better is you look at yourself and you realize how stiff you are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then you, um, the more you do, the more relaxed you get. Mm -hmm. And that's really the key because then you start coming out a bit more and you know, you, your personality comes through. Mm -hmm. But yeah, like um, uh, I've, I've, we could see the progression from start to where we are now. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's a lot better. Um, you know, just n knowing how expressive to be, mm, yeah. um, mm -hmm. knowing how your body language comes across, yeah. you know, and the best thing to do is, you know, I watch the videos and I analyze and, you know, I'm always unhappy about something and, mm. you know, you take it on and then you remember it the next time. Yeah. Um, yeah. also it's about managing other people because mm. now that I've got quite comfortable in front of camera, mm. 
when I'm interviewing someone else, they're not necessarily that comfortable. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, you know, sometimes I find they're turning their head. So I realize that I give them a little brief before I say, mm -hmm. okay, we're going to keep this very short. It's going to be mm -hmm. about 30 seconds. So mm -hmm. when I ask you, I need you to be concise. I need you to face the camera. Mm -hmm. I need to speak about this for, you know, because, you know, they don't know all this stuff. So that yeah. I, because uh, yeah. if I just start and go off, they, they don't necessarily know. So, yeah. so True. managing other people in the video is, is, is key. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I I remember when Sid started doing his videos. It's very different <laughs> from now, and, and now oh, he can he can uh, shoot a video and edit it very quickly. And he's just really comfortable in front of the camera. Yeah. And he also tells me that uh, when you're doing video, you need to be like the overexcited, overly animated version of yourself. Yep. Because the video will always. Um, Take away energy. Take from away your, energy a bit. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 You really gotta, you know, put it but, on. Yeah, I'd, I'd say the camera uh, adds 10 kgs and removes like 10 percent points, of your uh, 10 percent of your energy. So yeah. it's, it's great for your self confidence. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Especially when you've recorded Startup Hustle podcast episodes while very, very pregnant. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and now like one month in. So yeah. 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 So the, uh, the the hardest thing I still find is actually um, doing the kind of filming yourself and talking because mm. you're more concerned about everyone else around. Mm. Yeah. And uh, so sometimes well, also I have no shame now. Yeah. No yeah. Shame. So you see, so you're probably better at that than I am because I I still have a bit of trouble sort of. Placing yourself and, it, exactly. and how it looks, how yeah. it makes you look. Yeah. In fact, uh, in fact, uh, I find it strange when there's a camera person. You know, uh, like yeah. uh, when when somebody else is controlling the camera, I find it weird. Yeah, yeah so yeah. so so I'm used to that now. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So um, I'm used to that now, and actually, it's uh, it's funny because um, uh, my business partner pushes this more. He's like, okay, right. Even if you're not filming something, I want the cameras on Paris because I want people asking, yeah. <laughs> who is this guy? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yep. And it's like, make sure you've got the micro the big microphone on and the big yep. lens. Isn't yep. that what happened to us though? You know, uh, the thing about how we met was uh, I was at a dinner at uh, Capital Club, Capital Club in yep. DIFC, and uh, I saw this. Uh, I saw Paris with the cameraman, and I was just curious because like his setup looked like a vlogging setup. So I just asked him, like, uh, "Are you guys shooting uh, like for YouTube or something?" Because you know, I'm a YouTuber. So uh, so that's how I actually got introduced to to him. So I guess it works. Yeah, yeah. It definitely. <laughs> works. Yeah, 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 no, exactly. I mean, draws attention. Um, yeah, I just need a big. I need Mahel to wear a t-shirt. Guy in Dubai, he's got <laughs> yep. his business cards. So, yeah. Yep. Um, so yeah. Okay. Cool. Uh, great. So, um, I think we've covered everything. Yeah. So, the end of the show, we usually ask people, um, you know, what advice they'd have for new entrepreneurs, or yeah. for what would you like to share with other entrepreneurs? Well, I think one of the things I shared already mm -hmm. um, is about finding your passion. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe our passions change over time. Mm -hmm. So, and, but certainly when we leave university and we're conditioned to think that we want to be Mr. Successful and Mr. Billionaire and the next Bill Gates, uh, you have to go through a few experiences to realize that life is much more deeper than that. Mm -hmm. Um, and then you, maybe you find your passion. And I think then once you found your passion, you need to ensure that you do your passion with no other distractions. And that's the only thing you do. Mm -hmm. Um, okay. no plan B's just got to make the passion work mm -hmm. um, and keep going no matter how hard it is because you will continue with your passion like Steve Jobs said mm -hmm. any rational person would give up mm -hmm. if they're not passionate about it so um, I think that's what will give you the edge over everybody else the fact that you will continue doing it uh through the tough times yeah that's what counts um, the tenacity yeah exactly i mean it, i mean tenacity is a trait in us as humans but also depending on what you're doing you can be so much more tenacious mm. with something that you love exactly mm. because you love it right yeah so, so I, I i think that you know is, is a, a very simple and basic uh piece of advice but mm. actually realizing what you're really passionate about um took some time it, mm. it took me 30 years mm -hmm. um and then actually putting it into process took a couple more years before i actually did it mm. and now you know it's i'm doing what i love to do um starting to make money mm -hmm. but i'm you know not making huge money just yet mm. but you know time is the friend 
Yeah. Mm. When 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 you're doing something that mm. you're passionate about. If you're doing something you're unpassionate about, time is you your enemy. You won't put in the time. Yeah. yeah. You know, so so basically I know I'm on the roll now. Yeah. You know, it, like it's just going to continue and it's going to get, get bigger better. and bigger and and time will start to reward mm-hmm. uh, yeah. what I'm doing. But um Yeah. Yeah, they say on average like most businesses take 3 to 4 years before they start. um really firing you know yeah. like on on all cylinders so yeah. if you don't have the passion I, do, i think most people fail to reach that point, point of 3 to 4 years yeah. yeah till they really start seeing the business yeah. succeed yeah. yeah yeah so no more running to the gym to save on taxi fare yeah, yeah, yeah. i don't yeah. have to do that anymore but you yeah. know what uh the if, grind's important i think yeah but if if i go if if things financially go wrong mm mm-hmm. I'm willing to continue to keep pursuing because you know like this is what I would love doing. Yeah. yeah. So um And you've done it before so yeah. you're like I can do it again. Yeah, yeah, it was it was thrilling for me when when I didn't even have much filming going on and I was still trying to get it off the ground. Now I'm certain visions of the dream are happening yeah. and have happened and yeah. some of them have freakly happened almost exactly like i wanted them to happen okay uh some of these things were actual episodes that we created like mm. the victory team episode where mm. i was racing the world's fastest power boat that was a dream i had like 3 years before when i saw uh people racing these things in abu dhabi and i was like I'm going to drive one of these mm-hmm. in, in, in a show. That's But cool. other things were things like business meetings mm-hmm. where I knew who was going to be in the room and how it was going to be mm-hmm. and and that I was going to be talking with these people and and signing deals and that happened as well. Mm-hmm. So um so parts of the vision have started to become a reality and there's much much more mm-hmm. that I have planned that will start to become a reality. Yeah, it's motivating when you see certain things come come into play and then you're like okay i'm headed in the right direction my passion's paying off yeah, you know yeah. yeah that's awesome on that note uh, i think we're going to wind up this podcast uh, you can find uh, you can find him on um, guy yeah. in dubai pretty much everywhere yeah, yeah. Uh, social channels are all guy in dubai so youtube and instagram and all that so okay. follow yeah. guy in dubai and uh, linkedin it's paris uh, norris paris norris paris norris yeah um and uh, yeah uh, because we use anchor you can leave a voice message for paris as well and we can have him on the show maybe post uh, emirates guy in dubai yeah. um and he can answer your questions related to production if you're a business looking for a motivational speaker or an mc someone hosting the event or for video production you can get in touch with guy in dubai Yeah. yeah we'll have all his links in the description so you can go find it over there mm-hmm. uh if you like this episode make sure you leave us a rating if you're listening to us on a podcast platform or if you're on youtube make sure you subscribe and hit that like button we produce this content all the time at least uh, twice a month yeah uh so it um, was it was once a week now we have a baby girl so it's twice a month so it's kind of slipped to twice a month yeah. but uh but we try to be regular so yeah. uh yeah Okay, keep Super. on awesome. Thanks for being on the show. Thank you very much for having me on. Cool. Keep on hustling. <laughs>